all are made possible because of your support for Revelation Foundation. Thank you for making it possible. Hello and welcome to this special series of interviews we're doing for this crucial general election in 2015. On Thursday the 7th of May you will have an opportunity to vote that will determine which political party forms the next government. And in today's interview I'm interviewing the Right Honourable Stephen Timms representing the Labour Party and he's running as a parliamentary candidate. Uh, Stephen Timms, it's a great pleasure to interview you today. Can you share, some you th can you share something about your uh, Christian background and how your Christian faith has shaped your politics? Because you've been in uh, a, position, a ministerial position, you've also served as an MP and you're hoping to get re-elected uh, for the Labour Party this election. Well, I think, like every Christian, the way I think about things, political or other things, is fundamentally shaped by what I believe. And for me, that's particularly the case because um, I became a Christian in my teens through attending a Crusaders Bible class. I didn't do anything political as a teenager or as a student. But when I left university, I went to live in East London and I joined the Labour Party. That was when I got politically engaged. But the reason I went there was because while I was a student, I'd helped out on a church mission for a couple of weeks one summer. And so... And, and when I moved into the area and, and joined the Labour Party, I also joined the, the church, which by then had been planted by the mission team. So for me, my thinking about politics and about faith and what I wanted to do with my life have, all, have been very, very closely intertwined. And uh, for me, being a political representative in e East London, I, I'm doing it because that's the place God put me. Uh, Stephen, we're here to discuss uh, the uh, general election. Why is this election so crucial for the destiny of Britain? I think it is very important because I think the question is, is the country going to be run in the interests of a few people or in the interests of everybody? And it's a pretty fundamental choice, I think, that needs to be made on the 7th of May. I mean, some people have done extremely well over the last few years, but most people haven't. Most people are worse off in 2015 than they were in 2010. And there are some groups that I'm particularly concerned about, particularly concerned about young people, for example, who I think have had a very, very raw deal from this government. For many young people whose parents were buying homes in their 20s and 30s, that's just an impossible dream today. Uh, and for younger people still, education maintenance allowances were scrapped, university tuition fees were, were, were trebled. And I think there's a real sense amongst a lot of young people that politicians just aren't listening to them. And I think we really have to work hard to persuade young people that actually democratic politics does offer the chance of a better future for them and for everybody else. So I think there's a lot at stake, not just for our economic well-being and whether the country is run in the interest of everybody, but also in terms of persuading people that democracy is the right way forward. Uh, now, the coalition government have uh, been in power now for five years. Um, how will your policies of the Labour Party, and particularly you're hoping and praying that you uh, will get uh, elected and the uh, Labour Party will form the next government, um, how will your policies differ from that of the coalition government? Well, I think there are going to be some very important uh, differences. Uh, fairness, for me, is a very crucial issue in this uh, election. And the Conservatives, and the choice in the end is between a Conservative Prime Minister or a Labour Prime Minister, the Conservatives are proposing uh, to take £12 billion out of the welfare budget over the next couple of years. Now, in 2010, they told us that they would end the deficit in this Parliament. They failed to do that. The deficit had barely been halved during this Parliament. They proved to be uh, wrong in what they were claiming they, they would do. And so there, there are going to be some difficult decisions, whichever party forms the government uh, in the next few years, about how we get the deficit down. And we do have to get it down. There's no question uh, about that. But I think it is absolutely wrong at a time when we've already taken £20 billion out of the working age benefits budget, the consequence of which has been a million or so people having to go to food banks run by churches 
over the past year, and the churches have done an absolutely fantastic job on, on that, and I, I think that's a really uh, important development, actually, uh, on the part of the, the churches uh, running Trussell Trust food banks. But we've taken 20 billion out, we've seen the consequences of it, now the Conservatives are saying they're going to take another 12 billion out. Now we're saying this can be done in a much fairer way. Ed Miliband has been talking about abolishing non-DOM status, which enables some extremely rich people to pay a lot less tax than others. Uh, and I think it's really important now, when we can all see difficult decisions have got to be made, that we can persuade people that these decisions will be made fairly, and not simply by clobbering people who've already had a really hard time being forced to food banks and, and so on. So fairness is a really important decision. I think the future of the health service is absolutely uh, crucial. I think all of us can see the health service is in terrible trouble in lots of areas. People can't get GP appointments. Um, there are very long queues at accident emergency units and so on. Clearly something big has got to change there and we've got a plan for how to put that right. And the third area is one I mentioned already, the prospects for young people. I think we do have to say uh, to young people there is the prospect here of a decent future and this is how we're going to provide it for you. But can I say, can Labour be trusted on the economy? Um, primarily because uh, during your term in office we had the uh, terrible banking crisis that put all our finances out uh, through the reg uh, deregulation of the banking industry plus also running up a high deficit. Um, can Labour be trusted on the economy? Well, this time? De the deregulation of the banking industry took place, of course, under the Conservative government of Margaret Thatcher and, uh, and John Major. But it's of course, you're absolutely right. There was a worldwide economic crisis. We've got a big exposure to financial services in the UK, so we were particularly hard hit. Um, and with the benefit of hindsight, of course, we would have been in a better position if our level of spending had been rather lower than it was by the time we got to 2008. But in the run-up to 2008, the Conservatives agreed with our spending plans. So um, I don't think they can criticise now the level of spending we had, given that they agreed it at the time. But we do have a job on our hands, without a, a doubt, to persuade people that we can be... Uh, trusted people can be confident in Labour's stewardship of the economy, and I'm pleased with the progress we've we've made on that. There are undoubtedly still some people we have to persuade, but uh, I think the plans we're setting out do explain clearly how we can manage the economy successfully, not uh, in, indulge in uh, unnecessary extra borrowing, eradicate the deficit, but do it in a fair way. Now, one of the big issues that concerns a lot of our viewers uh, is the growing um, marginalisation of Christians politically and also socially, as many Christians find that they are discriminated in the workplace. Uh, many are, have been dismissed for sharing their faith or, or giving a Bible track or Christian track to one of their, their work colleagues. Um, what is your party doing to ensure Christian freedoms? Well, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. People feel very strongly about this, and there have been absurd cases of people being sacked for wearing a cross and British Airways check-in desk and this sort of nonsense, which should, uh, in, in my view, be completely absent from uh, our life. People should be able to express their faith freely. Um, I'm doing a number of things uh, about this. I chair the all-party parliamentary group on faith and society, where... What we're doing is wanting to help celebrate the contributions that faith-based organisations, church-based organisations, but other faith-based groups as well, are making in our communities. Support them and, where necessary, help remove the legislative barriers that sometimes get in their way, or it may, may actually not be legislation. Uh, local authorities are often quite reluctant to work with church-based organisations. I think they should be much more willing to do so. And actually in our all-party group we've drawn up a, a covenant for local authorities and faith-based organisations wanting to deliver services on behalf of local authorities to sign up to, to promote better working, better trust between councils and faith-based groups in their area. I'm delighted that's been signed so far by Birmingham City Council, which is the biggest council in, in Europe, Leeds City Council recently as well. I hope others will, will take that up. And I think there are things that government can do like that to build a much better relationship between government agencies, central government agencies, but perhaps more critically local government agencies and churches and other groups in their local areas. I think if we were to do that, 
we would be able to realise even more of the potential of church-based groups than we're seeing at the, at the moment. And one other area which I think is very important, I, I think it's crucial that the British government uses its influence to promote religious freedom around the world. So that's why we've argued, and Douglas Alexander, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, has proposed the appointment of a, an envoy reporting directly to the Prime Minister whose job it would be, on behalf of the British government, to promote religious freedom where it's at risk uh, around the world. I think we do need to give this issue a higher profile than uh, we've seen in appointing that person in the way I've described. I think it would be a good way to do it. Uh, many um, voters, particularly Christian voters, have been very uh, disappointed with the uh, coalition government for its implementation of same-sex marriage and more in particular the redefinition of marriage. Uh, where do you stand on this issue, Steve? Well, I voted against uh, a third reading of the uh, bill. Um, I felt that David Cameron really didn't quite grasp what marriage is. Um, and so I, I didn't support the legislation. Uh, most of my party colleagues did support it. Most of the members of all parties supported the legislation. Um, I didn't. Uh, we had a free vote on the issue, so we were able to vote uh, as we wished, and I uh, voted against while being on the Labour front bench. But, um, you know, it's happened. Uh, the law's been changed. I think we've got to live with that now. But I, I was disappointed that um, David Cameron had what seemed to me to be a, a, a wrong-headed grasp of what marriage actually was. Now, one of the big issues that is dominating this election so far is the issue of Europe. And uh, we've had the intervention of your former Prime Minister, uh, Tony Blair, in which essentially is saying that British people should not be trusted to have a referendum on our relationship with Europe. Uh, David well, no, Cameron... No, no, that's, okay. that's, a rather, I mean, that's certainly not what Tony Blair said. I mean, he did say, rightly in my view, that the referendum is not a good idea. Um, and I, the, the reason I think Tony Blair is absolutely right about this is the following, that you know, we've only halved the deficit in the last five years. The coalition told us they were going to eradicate the deficit in five years. They didn't. We've clearly still got a major economic problem that we have to surmount. And in order to surmount it, we need to really focus on securing new investment into the UK, bringing new jobs into the UK, making sure that people can have work and pay their taxes, and so pay down the deficit as a result of growth in the economy. Now, if we have a two-year referendum campaign in which nobody is going to know for sure whether we will still be in the European Union at the uh, end of the referendum or, or not, the consequence of that will be people will not be investing overseas investment where the UK has always done very, very well. People won't be investing uh, in the UK. They're going to wait and see. Uh, if we were by any chance to actually vote against staying in the EU, then people would be disinvesting, as some of the major um, investors, Japanese and others, have made clear. Now, I just don't think that is a sensible thing to be doing at a time when we've still got a massive deficit. We need to be focusing instead on how we can secure growth in the economy, secure employment and investment, uh, and then get through the deficit. And you know, once we've uh, done that, and once the economy is in, in better shape, then if people want to have this debate, then I think there'll be a stronger case for for doing it, although my view is we should stay in the European Union. We should change it, but we but should But surely the uh, British people should have an opportunity to vote on our membership of the European Union in light of so many transfer of national sovereignty to Brussels, and particularly in light of the Lisbon Treaty that has taken more and more power away from our own independent parliament and given it to, to European powers, well, and think, in particular with <clears> our foreign policy, that we're no longer in complete control of our own foreign policy because that's more or less dictated from Brussels. Well, actually, I, I think um, we, ha we are in, t uh, in charge of our foreign policy. I think there, there clearly is uh, a very much of uh, concern around UKIP, and I understand the points that they've been making, but I think they're, they're mistaken. We are in charge of our foreign policy, certainly. We are in charge of the crucial laws that we make, but we do increasingly, in an interconnected world, have to influence other countries as well. And on a whole raft of issues, not least environmental issues and the threat of climate change, which is ahead, which needs to be addressed, we'll only effectively do that if we can work successfully with other countries. We won't 
surmount that or many other security challenges, the threats that we face from uh, Islamic extremism, extremism. We won't surmount those challenges if we retreat into a little England position. We have to work with others, including in Europe and elsewhere around the world, including through Commonwealth countries and elsewhere where we have influence. And if we say we're going to pull up the drawbridge, pull out of Europe, just go back to a mythical past which never actually existed uh, anyway, then we will do irreparable damage to our standing in the world, to our influence as a, a country and to our economy. It's a wrong turning for us to, uh, to, to take. Now, if there was to be a proposal for further transfer of powers from the UK, from our Parliament, to the European Union, then I agree we should then have a referendum. But I don't think we should be having a referendum now about decisions that were made years ago. I think our focus should be on repairing the economy, repairing the national finances, um, and, and, and if there's a proposal for further change, then we should have a referendum. Since the last uh, general election in uh, 2010, the, the world has definitely become a more dangerous place. It's become uh, less stable. We've seen the emergence of the Islamic State in that time. We've seen uh, a resurgence uh, with Russian problems, particularly in the Ukraine and in, in Eastern Europe. And the world seems to be less stable than it was before. And the Conservative government has decided to cut our defence spending, which many of our military generals are warning that um, we can no longer protect our own borders uh, because our defence cuts are so short. What is Labour's party position on uh, the defence of the realm? Well, I think you're right. The world is becoming less stable. It doesn't seem very long ago that we were all thinking that the historic conflicts had all ended and everybody was fine and we needn't worry too much about these things anymore. Today that looks very different for the reasons that you said because of what Russia is doing and, and, and so on. Um, so our view is that very early on the next government needs to carry out a proper strategic defence and security review. The current government, the coalition, did have a review when they were elected, but the focus of it, as you said, was basically how to save money. We think we've really got to start from the standpoint, what do we need in order to maintain our own security and to wield the influence in the world that is necessary for us to, inf to, to, to wield? And once we've established from those first principles what the level of commitment that we need should be, then we have to find the uh, resources to deliver. But I think the first step is a, a proper uh, strategic uh, defence and security review. I also think we ought to be, we ought to be doing more to honour and respect those who serve in our armed forces. I think we should be uh, very vigilant against discrimination against military personnel, which there is, is uh, something. I think we need to do more to protect the interests of people who have served in the past in our forces. So, you know, there's a lot, a lot to be done, but the, 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 the first step, a proper strategic review, recognising what we need to be taking on over the next few years. One of the biggest uh, foreign policy challenges of our generation is that of the Islamic Republic of Iran gaining nuclear weapons. Now, we know that we've had um, a week of intensive talks with the uh, five plus one permanent members of the UN Security Council, which uh, Britain is a major player, um, in, in, in negotiating an interim deal with Iran, but that still leaves Iran's uh, nuclear plants um, in full operation. Uh, the, the, it's suspected by security experts that it's only nine months before Iran will now reach breakout, I meaning they have nuclear weapons. Uh, and considering that this is the world's most dangerous regime in the world, why is the West allowing this regime to have the capabilities of developing nuclear weapons? Well, the deal that's been reached with the leadership of uh, the USA, but with, as you say, the support of the UK government uh, as well, is that if Iran removes its capability to produce nuclear weapons, the sanctions will be lifted. Now, I, I think that is the right uh, approach. Of course, we have to make sure that Iran delivers on the commitments that it makes, just as they will be absolutely determined that sanctions should be lifted. And there'll no doubt be a period when there's a little bit of wariness about whether each side is going to deliver on what it's promised. And, you know, if it turns out that Iran does not deliver on its promises, then of course the sanctions will immediately be 
reimposed. But I think it's right to give a chance for a, a, a peaceful resolution of what has now been a very long-standing standoff with Iran. Um, I, I hope it's going to deliver. Let's wait and see. If it doesn't, then of course the sanctions need to be whacked uh, straight back on, and you know who knows, more might need to be done. But I, I, I would be hopeful, cautiously hopeful, that uh, both sides will deliver on the agreement that's been reached. Um, since uh, I last interviewed you for the European elections, we've seen the emergence of the Islamic State in uh, Syria and also in Iraq with devastating consequences for the ancient Christian communities. And, and nothing shows this more than the horrendous beheading of 21 Egyptian Coptic Christians by Islamic forces associated with the Islamic State in, in which they had their heads cut off. Uh, what can your party do to ensure... Uh, the protection of these vulnerable but ancient Christian communities in the Middle East because on the verge of extinction? Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is really uh, Im important. I've had some discussions with representatives of the historic denominations uh, in the, uh, the Middle East, been there for you know, virtually since the foundation of uh, the Christian church. Um, and uh, clearly... Uh, we're not in a position uh, to, uh, well, I mean, there is military action being taken. In my view, rightly, the Iraqi government invited uh, the UK and others to um, uh, apply airstrikes, and I think that's been the right thing to respond positively to those uh, requests. Um, I, I, I think what ISIL has been doing is just... Awful, and, and and everybody around the world can see how awful this is. Uh, Christians being treated in the way that you describe, but not only Christians, Muslims of a different hue, Yazidis, all are being m absolutely mercilessly slaughtered. Um, but I don't think we are in a position in the UK to to stop it uh, happening militarily. Uh, I hope that. Uh, the, those who are fighting against Islamic State in the Middle East can be supported. I'm encouraged by some of the progress that we've seen against ISIL in recent weeks. They have been evicted from some of the strongholds that they've uh, occupied. I think that's, uh, that's encouraging. Uh, and there may well be more that we need to, to do to support those who are resisting the evil that we can see being played out. But it's not going to be a, a short resolution of this. This is going to take some time. It's going to be a, a, a quite a long haul, um, I think. But I don't myself believe there is a shortcut to dealing with this appalling, uh, but I hope temporary phenomenon that we're seeing at the moment. I want to talk to you, uh, uh, bring up the issue of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict in particular. Now, know that uh, your leader, Ed Miliband, um, voted in Parliament in support of recognising a Palestinian state, which effectively is a de facto recognition of a unilateral Palestinian state outside of the cross-party consensus for the last two decades uh, on the Middle East peace process. Is there not a danger by recognising a Palestinian state prematurely that this not only endangers Israel's security but also threatens the well-being of the Palestinians themselves? Well, I think after 50 years it probably isn't premature. I think um, the Palestinians have... And I, I voted in favour of recognising the Palestinian state. I think anyone who's seen what... Palestinian Christians are putting up with in, in Gaza in particular, appalling privations, w uh, will have recognised that we can't simply allow this to, to carry on. Uh, uh, I, I don't think it's premature. I think the problem has been, and of course one perfectly understands why Israel has taken the position uh, that it has done, the, co the, the result has been deep, deep injustice to Christians and Muslims uh, in, in Gaza, in the West Bank. And I think those of us, all of us, who are concerned uh, about that injustice do need to say enough is enough. It's time to recognise that the Palestinians must have the opportunity to organise their own state at peace with Israel and its neighbours, two states secure and safe for the citizens of both, 
and to end the really inhumane suffering which people in Palestine have had to put up with for a very, very long time. Many of them Christians, but not just Christians. But wouldn't you say that's a lot to do with the failed leadership, not only of uh, the Palestinian Authority, um, incitement and hatred through its education system, through its media, the constant talk oh. of, of a genocide, well, and, and then, the rockets, and, and the then rockets, in Gaza, the rockets sent and then in, in Gaza you've got a situation where you've got a terrorist entity like Hamas that's committed to Israel's destruction, calls for genocide of the Jewish people I worldwide. Think, I think Hamas is a result of the failure of the process over 40 or 50 years. It's a symptom of things having gone very, very badly wrong. We have to find a new way forward for that part of the Middle East. And in my view, a commitment which everybody nominally agrees, including, uh, I think, the Israeli government, although Prime Minister Netanyahu suggested otherwise just before his re-election, but I think everybody agrees there does need to be a Palestinian state. The trouble is, up until now, that has been in word only. I think it's time for action to make it happen before it's too late because the spread of settlements uh, is increasingly making the realisation of a Palestinian state non-viable. Uh, I think we've got to act quickly and recognising Palestine as a state is a really crucial step to allow, allow that to happen. Otherwise the future for the region is a pretty desperate one. Uh, we've seen absolutely shocking uh, terrorist attacks uh, this year in Paris and also in Copenhagen, uh, which have also the Islamic State, uh, Islamist terrorists have actually targeted uh, members of the Jewish community, which is causing um, considerable heartache in the Jewish communities, not only in Britain but also in Europe, with fundamental questions being asked. Is there a future for mm. British Jewry? Is there mm. a future for European Jewry? Um, what is your party going to do to tackle the evil that is anti-Semitism? Well, I think we have to be absolutely vigilant against anti-Semitism. We've seen in our history in Europe where that can land us up in the past. Uh, and I am very worried about some of the things that we've seen. Uh, I, I think the Jewish community in the UK is a really interesting example of a community that came from often Eastern Europe 100, 150 years ago and thrived, made a, an enormously positive contribution and for a very long time was a very safe community, a very safe, Britain was a very safe place for the Jewish community to be. For some people, as you say, it doesn't feel safe any longer. I think we've got to be very vigilant about this. I think we have to protect uh, the Jewish community where there are threats to them. Another thing I'd like to see us doing more of is something that I am seeing happening in, in, in my area, building cooperation between Muslims and, and Jews. And of course there are common interests, kosher and halal, are very, very similar uh, approaches to meat. And some of the threats that have been uttered to the rights of Muslims to halal methods of slaughter are equally threats to Jewish kosher methods. I was having another discussion recently with um, some uh, imams in my area talking about shared interests with the Jewish community about what happens at burial. So I think there are encouraging signs of a, a shared interest between the Jewish community and the Muslim community in the UK, I think building that will be one way that we can make sure that we have both a, a British Jewish community and a British Muslim community that's completely at home in the UK and able to contribute in a very positive way as the Jewish community has done for so long. And uh, finally Stephen, uh, why should our viewers vote uh, Labour at uh, this year's general election? I, I, I think it comes back again to fairness is the country going to be run in the interests of everybody or is it going to be run in the interests of a, a few people at the top? There are some crucial changes that we need to make to ensure not just that well-off people get better off but that everybody uh, benefits from the economic recovery that's now underway. I think we've got to work hard to safeguard the National Health Service. It needs additional resources. That's why we proposed a, a mansion tax on homes worth more than £2 million pounds to get a, a two and a half billion a year fund to give the NHS time to care and I think we've got to do more to enable young people to get a university place or an apprenticeship or a job and commit to making sure that young people have got a decent future in the UK.
Uh, Stephen Sims, thank you so much for joining me you. on this election special. Thank you.